So is it possible that your immune reaction to either natural infection or vaccination could be passed on to the next generation? Yes, this is completely legitimate question and this is what we're going to be talking about today's uh, video. My name is Dr. Mikhail Rashik of Neurogenomics and let's get going. So this is based on a new paper that I read not that long ago which actually discussed exactly that the possibility of how Im Im the immune response could be passed on to the next generation. Now this was done in mice so not in humans but let's find out what we could learn from this uh, information and this is going to be a bit of a complicated topic so bear with me there's a lot of information to go through before we actually answer this question so you just please arm yourself in in patience okay so first of all when the mrna shots came out it was assumed that they are not going to be inflammatory and the reason why for that was assumed is because first of all the genetic material the mrna component it's not identical to what is actually found in a virus it's it is being modified so it, it's uh, made out of slightly different chemicals than what you would naturally found in in the virus and for and that was assumed that it would not be causing inflammation and on top of that the the lipid nanoparticle that is housing the genetic material that is injected into people that was assumed to be inert. It turned out that that, that was not correct and that these mRNA injections are actually quite inflammatory and we know that this is specifically from the lipid nanoparticles that they are actually inflammatory it was uh, discovered because it doesn't matter whether you have the genetic material or not um, before you cause the inflammation and more specifically it's one what these lipid nanoparticles are made of that causes the inflammation in fact these are inflammatory enough that these um, injections the mRNA vaccines they do not adjuvants adjuvants are additional compounds that are being added whenever vaccination takes place in order to stimulate the reaction of the immune system to come to the site of injection and recognize hey something is happening here <laughs> so we better start responding to uh, to, to this injection site uh, with the actual mRNA injections because of how inflammatory the actual lipid nanoparticle that is housing the genetic material is you don't even need adjuvants so these injections just don't have it so that's what was discovered uh, at some point however it is known that inflammation can be problematic to the immune system and in fact at some point if inflammation is chronic it can even lead to something like um, immune system exhaustion okay so the authors of this publication wanted to study hey what do these lipid nanoparticles that is housing genetic material could do to the immune system and they studied this in mice so what they did is they injected mice with with lipid nanoparticles that contain genetic material or basically a vaccine for influenza one of the influenza virus proteins uh, the protein specifically uh, was hemagglutinin and so instead of say using mRNA genetic material for spike protein it just used it for specifically for um, influenza protein so this would be think of it like these mice were injected with mRNA based influenza vaccines and what they discovered these authors is that soon after the injection um, they basically if the mice were were um, injected again within a short period of time there was not a proper antibody immunological response in that antibodies were not actually produced um, specifically and there so there basically there was a suppression of the immunological response so that antibodies could not be produced as effectively because of the prior exposure just to just to uh, the lipid nanoparticles they could confirm that because whether they injected the whether the lipid nanoparticles contained the genetic material or not was irrelevant it pro it prevented immunological response in terms of antibody production so then um, what basically and this was um, evident for at least four weeks it was also um, observed to be happening all over the body but even after eight weeks post first injection they could still see that there was some suppression of the immune system so clearly what's happening is that uh, the injection is 
preventing proper response of the immune system. Now, what they were also discovering is that um, number one, they suspect that this is because of the inflammation that that the injection itself is causing, and this is and this might be important for the human uh, mRNA injections. And the reason why is because it suggests that perhaps we ourselves m should be spacing these injections m further apart than what we did historically, which was we typically for almost everyone. They, these injections were spaced three weeks apart, and this suggests that perhaps they should have been um, spaced apart more so than, than that. And that's, um, and that's been confirmed in studies, uh, in, in studies showing that um, when you um, space the injections further apart than just three weeks, you had a better immunological responses than, than, than uh, if it was if these if vaccination shots with the mRNA injections are spaced only three weeks apart. So this actually confirm, confirms this. And what they were able to show is that if you inject it in one site, you might improve the immunological response if the second injection was further was at another site. Because typically the immunological response um, was happening with the lymph nodes closest to the injections, injection site. So that's what they learned. Um, at, the f at first, in terms of what the lipid nanoparticles might be doing, okay, so that's so we're still far away from from inher inheritance of this response and how that might work in in mice. So they obviously, as I mentioned, they were looking at that potentially this might be inflammation. But here comes the first surprise result of of the study. What they discovered as well is that mere exposure of these mice to these lipid nanoparticles what that included the genetic material for producing influenza protein meaning there, there were influenza vaccines so that you start you're supposed to start producing antibodies against influenza despite the fact that the production of antibodies was being suppressed what they discovered is that actually these mice were subsequently protected from infection by influenza. So the exposure to lipid nanoparticles helped to help to protect these mice from subsequent virus infection anyway. So this wasn't to do because of uh, with the antibodies. They suspected that it actually was because of that inflammation. So the same inflammation that was causing um, improper response in terms of production of antibodies, that same inflammation might have been protecting from viral in infection subsequently, which is the exact purpose of inflammation. This is why, why inflammation e exists and why, why, why we, at times we need inflammation in terms of protection from pathogenic infections. So that was an interesting observation. And by the way, they also looked at as to why there is this lack of response and what they were discovering is that what happens is the inflammation in the end actually suppresses the proper use of the genetic material in order to produce the antigen. So in, in case of the human mass vaccination programs right now in this pandemic, the antigen is of course the spike protein. In this case, this, this was the influenza protein. So it's the production of the influenza protein from the genetic material inside these vaccines that was reduced. So of course, this should be important to look in humans whether, whether something similar is also happening. And if it were, it means that if the vaccines were being close, closely injected together, they might have actually prevented mm, adequate amount of buildup of the spike protein inside inside the body and perhaps that that could have also prevented um, re immunological response but that would have to be confirmed whether what we're observing in mice could possibly uh, happening in humans but the authors are saying we need to look into this because because whatever it is happening we are need to know this for the future use of such technology and now we finally get to the super big surprising result that what they discovered w was that the injection of mice with these anti-influenza mRNA vaccines w was the immunological response that these mice experienced with regards to not being as easily inhibited by or not as easy sorry not as easily infected by the influenza subsequently that protection 
from these lipid nanoparticles injection into the parent parent muscles mice was passed on into the progeny into the litter litters of these mice so it's a big surprising result i suppose although not a new result this has been observed in a, a, in recent studies that immunological response can be transgenerational and it could be passed on to the next generation now so how does it work we're about to get to that as well Let's talk about what these authors did. So they, they basically vaccinated these mice with the anti-influenza mRNA vaccines housed in the same lipid nanoparticles. Those are the same lipid nanoparticles that the, they used that are, were used in the human vaccines. And they vaccinated either mom or dad or both parents or none. So basically they did all combinations possible. And they started to see what happens to the progeny to their the litters or baby mice in terms of protection from influenza so they basically bred the mice baby mice were born and then they infected the baby mice with influenza and they looked at the body weight of the infected mice because the the disease would cause mice to start losing weight and they could tell how severely the disease is progressing obviously if the parents were never exposed to the lipid nanoparticle injection with the mRNA genetic material for the influenza. The baby mice did poorly, they were losing weight. Now, if you injected both parents, then the baby mice actually had a protection from influenza. But what's important to know is that, look, if a mom was injected, then clearly she would be passing on to the antibodies uh, through through the through the placenta to the babies so that means the babies are protected so that's not a surprise but if they only vaccinated a dead nevertheless they were still seeing protection of in in the baby mice from being infected by the influenza so that that means there was a they had had nothing to do with antibodies being passed on this had to be passed on through inheritance so they could tell that if both parents were were um, injected there was a protection if dead was injected there was a protection not as good as with both parents were 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 injected definitely much better than of course if no parents were being injected and they test multiple generations and in subsequent generations the effect was waning it waned faster for just dead alone, but even in a second generation, if both mom and dad were being injected, there was still full protection, but if, but if dad was being injected in the second generation, there was, there was still some protection as well. And then in subsequent generations, there was in the fourth generation of litter, there was no more protection from dad, but there was still some even even in the fourth generation, there was still some weak protection from both parents. So clearly, it means this effect of being of an, of inheriting the immunological response that you experience and passing it on to the children wanes over time. So it does not last throughout the lifetime of these animals. So of course, the big question is: Can this happen in humans? And we don't know. This is a very new field of science. We're only discovering this really right now, but there's maybe some supporting evidence. For example, it's been observed in the past that children of fathers who have been vaccinated against tuberculosis have a lower mortality rate from such infection than, than those children whose fathers have, were not vaccinated. So there's some maybe supporting evidence, but clearly this needs studies. And like I mentioned, this is a brand new field of, of science that is opening up to us. How is this done? They're suspecting that this is through epigenetic modification of DNA. So what do I mean by epigenetic modification? This is where you can start chemically modifying your DNA material that you will be passing on to the next generation. When I say by chemically modifying epigenetically, it means there is additional information being placed on the DNA itself. So the DNA code is not changed itself. There's extra information put on top of it. And then this has been indeed observed in one of the past studies that looked into such transgenerational passing on of, of immunological response from one generation to another. 
So that's why epigenetic modification of the DNA that is being passed on to the next generation is currently believed to be the largest suspect of what's actually involved here. So really, really interesting concept that how you experience your life through your more immunological responses could be passed on to the next generation, at least when it comes to mice, because that's where these studies have been observed. And it would be really interesting to start investigating this more closely in humans. Really interesting study I wanted to share with you because obviously this is a big deal for us to know in the future. And um, time will tell what we're going to discover on this topic. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here. I just want to let you know we have another COVID Q&A coming up. So please uh, check it out. You can get free tickets if you subscribe to our newsletter. And we hope to see, see some of you there. Basically, we answer COVID Q&A questions. <laughs> Pictures getting more and more complicated all the time as more and more science is emerging. I also wanted to remind you we have ongoing surveys as well. We have one about, hmm, what else, epigenetic modification of your genetic material in terms of discovering how you are biologically aging, so you can actually see how you biologically age in comparison to what your chronological age is, and you can biologically age slower or faster, and that likely looks that it's related to the response, the quality response of your immune system. So check it out, uh, check out that survey if, if this is something that you might be interested in. One way of actually using this type of technology could be to determine, to monitor how well your immune system is doing at a given time. So if that's something of interest to you, please let me know. We're going to be onboarding this finally soon. And um, that's all I have for you for now. I just want to say thank you again for all your support. Thanks for all the comments. Um, I keep obviously checking out, keep collecting questions for those COVID Q&A events. And I try to respond whenever I can. Thanks for all the likes. And uh, obviously, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do and share the videos. This is how we grow. And I look forward to seeing you in the next installment. Bye, everyone.